Now we invite your careful attention as we ask our brother Matthew to speak on the subject, When Shall We See the Return of Jesus? Good afternoon everyone. <clears throat> so a brief look at the life of Jesus up to his resurrection would show us that he overcame every trial set before him. He preached the gospel, he taught about God's word, God's promise about himself, about the kingdom to come. He was crucified and he turned down every opportunity to escape the suffering and the humiliation, the ordeal of his trial and death. But as such a perfect sacrifice, he conquered sin. The grave couldn't hold him. He rose again to a new life. He gave mankind a hope of a new life, of the kingdom of God with, with Jesus as king. And so this afternoon, God willing, I'd like us to look at what is to happen now, to look at the kingdom and to specifically look at when we may see this kingdom. And to see the return of Jesus. I don't intend to go too deep into the topic, just a look through God's Word, the Bible, and pull out points necessary for us to understand what Jesus taught was to happen before he'd be, He would return again. So, the question then when shall we see the return of Jesus? Well, we can answer that straight away. We've already read the answer together in our reading in Matthew and chapter 24. <clears throat> Matthew 24, verse 36, we have Jesus speaking and he says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Well, I say we could answer the question, but what we're told is specifically, we don't know because we have things to look out for. But Jesus says, no man, not even the angels, know when he shall return. Only God, his father, knows when he shall return. Well, that poses a problem for us, doesn't it? Well, actually, no, it really, it actually eliminates a problem. Because if we read through the Bible, it gives, us a, it gives us signs to look out for, to tell us that Jesus will be returning soon. But if we didn't know exactly when he was to return, then we would have a problem. Because we'll... I say we all, I, certainly I, in, we, do, we do something that's in our, our nature, something that the students are famed for, procrastination. If we have a deadline for homework or coursework or, or whatever it is we know, whatever it is, we know exactly how long we have to complete it. We know we can maybe take this afternoon off or maybe give this weekend a miss. And it usually ends up in a panic nearer the deadline. But if we were given a task and told that the teacher or tutor, whoever it was, could ask for it at any time between now and an indefinite period, then that's a different story, isn't it? We want to get it done in case we're asked for, for it that day or tomorrow. And it's the same with us following God. If we knew exactly when Jesus was coming, then by our very nature, we would, it, would, it would provoke an extra temptation in us. An extra temptation to deal with, to live our lives how we want, and then to catch up nearer the time. But that's not how God works, is it? And that's not how worshipping God works. If we follow the Bible, we need to be constantly learning and constantly trying to please God because Jesus could return at any time. 
So after Jesus' resurrection, what happens? Well, before his death, Jesus says in, in John 11 that he's the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So Jesus' purpose on the earth during his mortal life was to conquer sin and to be a sacrifice that he may be resurrected and give us a hope of life. He's done this now. This task is complete. We have the New Testament in our Bibles to read along with the Old. We have the Gospel records to begin the New Testament. We can read about Jesus and his teachings. So what next? Turn with me please to Luke in chapter 24. Luke 24, going into verse 51. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them, the apostles, and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. So Jesus' work on earth it was now done for the time being. It was up to the apostles to go out and teach us far and wide as they could about the word of God and about Jesus, to continue the, the preaching mission of Jesus. Jesus was to rise to heaven to sit with his father and await his return to the earth at the appointed time. And these are the last three verses of the Gospel of Luke. And what verses they are. What great joy and hope were expressed within the final words from Luke inspired by God. They worshipped Jesus. They went to the temple and praised and blessed God. But why did they worship Jesus? They worshipped Jesus because they knew they would see him again. We read it in our reading, he would return again, but this time not the lowly son of man, not the servant, but as the king. He shall return in great triumph to, to, to sit upon God's throne in God's kingdom. Can we turn to the Acts, please, in chapter 17? Because we now wait patiently for his return. We're not told exactly when it will be. We're given the signs to look out for. We're told what must happen upon the earth before Jesus returns. So we can look out with eager anticipation at the signs awaiting his coming. So Acts 17, verse 31 and 32. Because he, God, hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So we may not know when Jesus will return, but God does. The day has been appointed so that as many as possible can hear God's word, can have opportunity to accept it, to obey him. But of course many will not and God will never let man completely destroy each other. So we know Jesus will return before then. And when Jesus does return, we read that those who have died who came to a knowledge of the world will be raised to judgment. And then, God willing, everlasting life, if found obedient. All of those from Bible times right through to today. Chapter 11 of Hebrews lists a great many faithful men and women of old who shall be risen when Jesus returns. And all of this was made possible by 
an extraordinary life, a completely unique life of overcoming temptation, of beating sin, a feat not managed before Jesus or in over 2,000 years following, a perfect life prophesied, but a hard life, particularly in, in, in his ministry, a life of little rest, of constant trial, of those standing against him. Sometimes even his closest friends betraying or denying him. But he overcame all of this. And so what can we look forward to because of this? Let's have a look to, in Isaiah in chapter 35, if you will, please. Isaiah 35, reading from verse 5. That the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons, where each lay, shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And then verse 9, No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. Shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs of everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The blind shall see. The deaf shall hear, the lame shall leap, the tongue of the dumb shall sing. There shall be waters in the desert. Parched land shall become a pool. And it was about 15, 20 years ago, I think, that scientists have found pools and pools of water underground in Africa in the Sahara Desert that they had no idea were there before. They call it the ancient mega lake. And I think there may be up to a hundred times more water under the ground of these vast desert areas than there is above the ground. Pools just waiting to burst up and flood the desert plains. Pools that can help explain what happened to a lot of the water after the flood. As we read in the wilderness, shall waters break out. There shall be habitation where no habitation has existed for hundreds of years or more. Where no habitation has existed. So yeah, where habitation has existed for, for hundred years or more. No more famine. A new sat satellite technology is finding ancient cities buried deep below the desert sands. God will provide life once more where there has been no life for a long, long time. There should be no aggressive beast, no illness, but peace and praise and song and worship. Sorrow and sighing shall be no more. There shall be joy and gladness. What a time that shall be. What a time to look forward to. And all made possible by God and by the sinless, obedient life and willing sacrifice of Jesus. And yet Jesus was such a humble man. He called himself a servant. And yet we all owe our very lives to him. A lack of time prevents us from turning there. But to, to read more of the kingdom in your own time, if you, you'd like to have a look at Isaiah in chapter 11, personally, a favourite chapter of mine. And then verse 1 prophesies the return of Jesus to earth. Verse 2, the spirit of God. The knowledge of God's, of, of God's spreading through the world. Verse 4 and 5, the evil people in the world shall be killed. But the good, the righteous are to be rewarded. The wild animals will be tamed as they were in the Garden of Eden before the fall. The children can play in safety. 
They can't do that now. In these modern times, if you let your children go out and play in the, in the streets by themselves, you'd be constantly worrying, and rightly so, that they, they won't come back. But in the kingdom, in the kingdom there's to be peace, to be safety. So then what do we know about when Jesus will return to establish God's kingdom? Well, if we can turn back to the reading we had in Matthew chapter 24, please. <clears throat> Matthew 24, where we read in verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So as to the exact hour, or even the day, the month, nobody knows. Even the angels in heaven, we read, do not know when the appointment, appointed time will be. But God knows. God knows the end from the beginning. His plan in the earth is unfolding every minute of every day in preparation for the return of his son to establish that kingdom that will fill the earth with the, the knowledge of his glory. But Jesus does give us a few clues to look out for, to prepare ourselves on the way, to look out for and seek the kingdom. He says in verse 4 and 5 to his disciples, Be careful nobody tricks you. Many shall come in my name and say that I am Christ. I am Jesus. But it won't be me, because certain things have to happen on the earth before I return. Verse 6, there will be wars and rumours of wars, or fear that a war is about to begin somewhere in the world. Verse 7, famines, illness, earthquakes in diverse places. Verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. The entire world will be able to have access to reading the word of God. Verse 22, man will have the ability to completely destroy himself. Verse 37, Jesus shall come when the world is in a state as it was in the days of Noah. So what was the world like in the days of Noah? In Genesis 6, we read, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. He went on to say that the earth is filled with violence. Well, how familiar is that a world full of evil and violence with fighting in Israel with suicide bombers with clashes all over the world but of course we may rightly say that this is nothing new there's always been violence in the earth for as long as any of us can remember but not for long because we look for the signs of the return of Jesus and they would suggest the return is soon. In verse 5 and 6 he says, many will come in my name, will try to trick you. What greater example do we have on the earth now than the Pope of Rome for example? He calls himself the head of the Catholic Church, the Holy Father. But if this so-called head of the church his father was to pick up his bible and read ephesians 1 verse 22 we would see that god gave jesus to be the head of all things to the church or the ecclesia the ecclesia the called out ones jesus is the head not the pope not anybody else who comes in his name the pope was appointed by man Jesus was appointed by God. In verse 7, it says, There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse or varied places. Well, what do we see and read about in the news? Poverty and illness everywhere. Look around at some illnesses even created by or because of man. We've seen earthquakes all over the world. 
including in our own country. With the increase in technologies, we're detecting more and more, along with modern era, modern era media and social media, allowing the news to be spread further and faster. So we're hearing about all of these problems around the world instantly, including from places we wouldn't have got to hear about in the past. Verses, if we read verses 21 to 22, we read, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not seen, so was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days shall be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. There'll be tribulation or pressure burden, persecution, trouble, such as never has been seen before on the earth. Man will have the ability to completely wipe himself out if God did not intervene. So look at modern warfare, modern nuclear weapons, new nations entering the nuclear arms, the arms race. Nations that even 10, 15, 20 years ago didn't have the capability Nations boasting about their arms and their power. Nations threatening each other from across the globe. And many say so. Many say they do this to keep the peace. But these are all things to look out for that Jesus says will happen before he returns. So we can clearly see these events happening around us. But what else does the Bible say? In Isaiah 43, God says, Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. God is promising that his people, the Jews, will return to the land of Israel, will have a home once again. As Christadelphians, we, we, we look at the trouble in Israel between the, the Palestinians and Israelis, but we know that Israel as a people that once more have forgotten their God. They're a godless people. They're a people who, among many others, are intent on violence and power. We have no more support for the modern day Israel people than we do for those who they fight. But they're a symbol to us of the Jews that God will bring back to the land when Jesus returns. Natural Israel may have forgotten their God, but spiritual Israel, those who are faithful to God, are adopted by God and through, through baptism into Jesus, become brothers and sisters in Jesus with God as their father. And so by watching natural Israel return home, we see a prophecy being fulfilled and a promise getting ever nearer. There's a prophecy in Ezekiel in chapter 37. We won't turn there, but it's, uh, it's, we, we call it the valley of dry bones, where God is to breathe life into these dry bones. And then the prophecy continues to say, these bones are the, the whole house of Israel. And God says they shall live and be placed in their own lands. So God prophesies through Ezekiel that although they have been cut off, Israel will be brought back to live as a nation. As a people, they will return to Israel, not as exiles with no homelands, no national identity, but as a nation. And this, over the last century, so long after these words were penned, has begun to happen to a big extent now. Between 1882 and 1948, less than 1% of the world's Jewish population lived in Israel, or what is now Israel. But in 1948, something special happened in Jewish, in Jewish history. The proclamation in 1948 of the State of Israel, when the half a million Jews that occupied the land by this stage, rose to one and a half million over the space of seven years. 13% of the world's Jewish population now occupied the land. 
By 2003, this had risen to 40%. Until in 2008, 60 years after the declaration of the establishment of the State of Israel, 91 years after the Balfour Declaration, our argued British support for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people, Israel finally once more became home to more Jews than any other country in the world. Only 16 years ago did Israel boast more Jews than any other country in the world, according to their census. And to put this into context, the Jews had no homeland since they were taken into captivity approximately 2,800 years ago. And only in the last 70 years have they been returning en masse. And still, there is controversy and fighting over the land. A fight that shall not end until the return of Jesus. So God's word is coming to pass right before our eyes. And just before Jesus returns, the Bible tells us of a, a great army headed by the king of the north. This being Russia and countries round about will come down and attack Israel. An attempt to resist them will be made by the king of the south. Nations connected with the, the biblical name of Tarshish that will make up these nations from the south. Now, Tarshish refers to, to Britain. It was heavily involved with trade in the south during Bible times. But Britain currently has an extraordinary amount of trade with the Gulf states. So much so that she has a considerable navy presence in the Persian Gulf to protect this trade. And more so now with what's happening in Israel at the moment. No doubt to keep an eye on the, the, the not so friendly nations surrounding the area at the same time. So Britain already has a military presence in the Middle East. Who the King of the South exactly includes is a matter of debate. We'll have to see. But we know that Jesus will return shortly after the King of the North, who we know is Russia, comes down against Israel. And so we read in Matthew 24 verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So the gospel will be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. We mentioned social media, modern technology, and how, how quickly and how far can news now spread through the world. The internet makes it possible for anybody to access almost anything including very easily the Word of God. Of course, some countries restrict such information, but there are still ways and means of spreading the news far and wide. So surely it must be close to the time of the end. So I'd like to finish by looking at some more of Jesus' words, a parable or a story in Matthew chapter 25. If we can turn there, please. <clears throat> Matthew 25, as one, one final reference. It's known as the parable of the ten virgins. It's nice and simple. Those wanting to be allowed into the kingdom of heaven, or more specifically, the kingdom of heaven on earth, should listen to this story and follow its example. There are ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. Simple, nice and simple for us. In verse 3, we read, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye, ye out to meet him. So they were waiting for the bridegroom to return. It was late, they fell asleep. They all had lamps with them, but the foolish hadn't taken oil. So their lamps burnt out. And suddenly at midnight, there was a cry that the bridegroom was coming. 
And Jesus in the Bible is referred to as the bridegroom. So they're, they're all waiting for the bridegroom, and, or, or in our case, Jesus, knowing he was coming, not completely sure at what time, but suddenly they're told he's coming. So the foolish virgins had to run away to fetch oil. And from verse 10 we read, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So those wise who are prepared were waiting for the bridegroom, were looking out for him. Although they didn't know exactly when he was coming, they knew he would be here soon. And they prepared themselves. But the foolish left it, at the last, left it to the last minute. They were not prepared. When they returned, it was too late. They were not allowed in. And Jesus teaches that we should look for the signs of his coming to prepare so that when he comes as our bridegroom, we may enter the kingdom with him. Those who do not prepare will not be allowed the promise of eternal life. It's no use waiting until Jesus comes and then, then trying to live our lives in righteousness. So now we wait patiently. We look for the signs in the world. We must have oil in our lamps and prepare for his coming. And so we pray we may see him soon. Thank you.